Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another of his fascinating stories about his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. You know, we're really happy to be back with you once again, and we're looking forward to getting together at this time every week from here on out. And I hope you won't mind if every once in a while I sort of get a word in edgewise about Petri wines. You know, and I really mean this, Petri wines are wonderful wines. For instance, right now, I wish I could give you a glass of Petri California port. You could hold that Petri port up to the light and look at its clear, deep red color. You could smell that luscious grape aroma. And best of all, you could taste that Petri port. What a flavor. That Petri port just sort of rolls around on your tongue, and oh boy, is that ever good. Try Petri port after dinner some evening, or try it when some friends drop in. You can serve it proudly, because after all, the name Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wines. And now let's look in on our good friend, Dr. Watson, and see if he's expecting us. Oh, come in. Come in, Mr. Bartow. You're just the man I've been expecting. How are you, Dr. Watson? It's good to see you again. Oh, thank you, my boy. It's very nice to see you again, too. I've missed our Monday night visits during the last three months. Sit yourself down. Uh, would you care to join me in a, in a glass of port? Well, thanks, Doctor. That'd be nice. You know, it seems to me, after our summer vacation, a toast to the great Sherlock Holmes would be in order. That's an excellent idea. Here you are, young fellow, my lad. Thanks. You propose the toast, Doctor. To Sherlock Holmes, master detective and loyal friend, whose adventures have brought considerable, shall we say, fame to a certain retired doctor now living in Northern California. I'll drink to that. Well, now, suppose I might as well get on with tonight's story. Which particular adventure have you selected, Doctor? One that I call the limping ghost. Sounds exciting. And, as usual, you find me saying, how did it begin? In Baker Street on a windy December evening at the turn of the century. A young, white-faced boy sat in front of our blazing fire. And as he told us his strange story, the flickering firelight danced weird patterns on the walls. The young man was Alexander McMorris, the seventh Earl of Loch Nair. The Earl of Loch Nair? Say, uh, didn't I read in the papers the other day that the 8th Earl of Loch Nair had been killed in an airplane accident? Quite right, my boy. Even in this day and age, the tragic history of violent death seems to dog the footsteps of the Loch Nair family. But to return to my story. On that December night in 1900, we heard the whole history of the limping ghost of Loch Nair. The first Earl had lost a foot at the Battle of Flodden Field in 1513. In spite of this terrible handicap, he fought on valiantly until he died on the battlefield from loss of blood. From then on, right until the time this story begins, the limping ghost, clad in a suit of armor, always appeared at Loch Nair Castle before and after the death of the current Earl. Yes, Mr. Bartell, it was a strange story that Sherlock Holmes and I listened to that night. A story of death and horror over the centuries, punctuated by the limping clank of ghostly armor. Milady, I have terrible news for you. Your husband, the Earl, was killed in the explosion that destroyed Lord Darnley. Milady, the Guy Fawkes plan to blow up the Houses of Parliament has failed. Your husband is in the Tower of London. They say he's to be hanged, drawn, and quartered. Madam, I regret to inform you that your husband, on my instructions, has been arrested for murder. I have no doubt that he will hang. And that's the story of the Loch Nairs, Mr. Holmes. You were instrumental in sending my great uncle to the gallows, a fate which he richly deserved, I'm told. So it seemed only natural to come here to Baker Street and consult you now that I'm in trouble. I shall be most happy to do anything I can to help you, sir. I don't remember anything about your sending the Earl of Loch Nair to the scaffold, Holmes. Well, he did, Dr. Watson. Mm-hmm. And the servants have always sworn the ghost really did walk at midnight on the day that he was hanged. Indeed. Now, sir, 
I suggest that you tell us what problem brought you here. The ghost is walking again, Mr. Holmes. You know what that means. According to the legend, that the present Earl will die. Exactly. And as I'm the present Earl, <laughs> you can see why I'm rather worried. Am I to understand that you've actually seen this ghost yourself? Yes, Mr. Holmes. The night before last, Betty, well, that is, Miss Nolan and I, were sitting in the dining hall in front of the fire when we heard a strange sound up in the musician's gallery. We looked up and in the moonlight saw a ghostly figure in armor limping towards the staircase. Oh, gracious me. Uh, my dear sir, you, you're certain that you really saw it? Moonlight can play strange tricks, you know. There wasn't any doubt about it, Doctor. We both saw and heard it. What did you do? I started to go towards the stairs, but as I did so, Betty screamed and then tumbled to the floor in a heap. Mm. Fainted, I suppose. Yes. While I was reviving her, the, the ghost disappeared. Who's staying with you at Lochner Castle at the moment? Well, there's Betty Nolan. She's the sister of James Nolan. He looks after my estate. Uh, Betty and I are engaged to be married. Oh, congratulations, sir. Thank you. <laughs> yes, indeed. Anyone else staying with you? Yes. A distant cousin of mine, Jeremy K. McMorris, an American. He turned up in England a couple of months ago with his son, Walter. They're both with me at the present. A distant cousin. That's right, Mr. Holmes. Actually, they're descendants of a more than usually black sheep branch of the family. I, uh, I don't know how long the old man's going to be with us, though. If you ask me, he's a dying man. How do you say that, sir? As far as I can gather, he's been wasting away for years... It's only a question of time before his strength fails him entirely. I uh, <clears throat> was hoping perhaps you could take a look at him, Dr. Watson. That is, uh, <clears throat> if I could persuade you and Mr. Holmes to come and stay at the castle for a few days. Well, what about it, Holmes? It's an intriguing problem, Watson. The current Earl of Lochner would seem to be in danger. A cousin of his is dying of an obscure disease, and the ghost of Lochner Castle is walking again. Yes, it's an irresistible invitation. I see no reason why we can't leave on the Scotch Express tonight. <laughs> Quite a heavy fall of snow here in your absence, young man. Quite so, and judging from the color of the sky, there's more to come. Oh, very angry looking. Oh, mm. well, now as we round this bend, you'll be able to see the castle. Ah, yes. There you are, gentlemen. <laughs> Magnificent. Yes, it's a fine place, all right, Doctor, though it cost me a great deal in upkeep. As a matter of fact, I only have one wing open. There's always been something of a problem to get servants to come and live here. See, the local villagers have a great respect for the Loch Nair ghost, you know. What servants do you have at the castle at present? A cook housekeeper, Mrs. McClintock, fine old lady who's been with me for six years now. And then there's old Tamas. He served my family for as long as I can remember. Well, as a matter of fact, there he is now. Hello, Tamas. I'm glad to see you back, my lord, and that's a fact. Oh, thank you, Tamas. Oh, these gentlemen are Mr. Sherlock Holmes, Dr. Watson. Good day to you, gentlemen. Good day, Thomas. Good day. Uh, before I take the trap round to the stables, I may as well break the news to you. Yes, what's happened, Tamas? It's your cousin, my lord. Poor old Mr. McMorris, he's dead. What? Died early this morning. God rest his soul. Dead? Well, I'm very sorry that I arrived too late to be of any help. Well, thank you for telling me, Tamas. Oh, you may take the trap round now. Aye, sir. I'll bring the baggage up late. So he's dead. Well, I can't say it's unexpected, but... It is a shock, nevertheless. I'm sure that it must be, particularly as you yourself told us you saw the ghost of Loch Nair the night before last. In which case... In which case, Watson, I think we may reasonably expect another visitation. Perhaps before the night is over. Shall we go in? This is Miss Nolan, my fiancée, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, and Dr. Watson. I'm very glad to meet you. How are you, Miss Nolan? And uh, this is her brother, James Nolan, the manager of my estate. How do you do, sir? How are you, Mr. Nolan? Much better for seeing you both up here. I'm sure it won't take you long to lay this ghost business by the heels. Oh, well, I trust you don't overestimate our abilities, Mr. Nolan. Alec, you've, you've heard about your cousin, of course. Oh, yes, my dear. Thomas told us as we drove up. Where is Walter? He went into the village with the doctor and... The body of his father. Oh. He should be back soon. How's he taking it? Very quietly. Too quietly, if you ask me. Those Americans are pretty demonstrative people, you know. And Walter has been no exception. But he behaved very strangely this morning. And the doctor told him his father was dead. He just said, now things will start to happen and then shut up like an oyster. I can't make head or tail of the fellow. Uh, yes, quite so, quite so. Uh, Mr. Holmes, I expect you and Dr. Watson would like to go to your room. Yes, I must go. I think first I'd like to take a look at the um, oh. musician's gallery, if you don't mind. Oh, yes, of course. Would you excuse us, darling? All right, Alec. 
It's uh, in the dining hall here. <laughs> they must have been very hospitable people in those days. Fifty or sixty people could eat at that table. <laughs> yes, Doctor. Needless to remark, we hardly ever use the room nowadays. There's the musician's gallery, Mr. Holmes. Oh, yes, yes, I see. How do we get up there? I'll show you. See, there's a stone staircase behind this tapestry here. Follow me. Watch your step. It's quite narrow, rather dark. Watch your head, Watson, old chap. Oh, don't worry about me, Holmes. I'm perfect. Oh, I say. Must have built these stairs for pygmies. Oh, yes. Here we are, gentlemen. This is the musician's gap. Hi, Joe. It must have made a pretty picture in the days gone by. A little string orchestra fiddling away up here and down below the Scottish nobility bobbing and floating round in the intricacies of a Highland chatiche or a stately gavotte or something. Where does that door lead to? To the bedroom wing. And that's where the ghost appeared from the other night, I suppose. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Uh-huh. The door's jar. Do you generally keep this door unlocked, sir? Why, no. But the key mysteriously disappeared about a week ago. James is having a new one made. So I must remind him about that. Alex! Alex, where are you? Oh, we're up here, Walter. We're coming down. That's Walter McMorris. My dead cousin's son. Well, fellow, this must be a dreadful day for him. Yes, I, I'm afraid this is going to be a rather painful interview. Oh, hello, Walter. This is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. How do you do, sir? How do you do? Sherlock Holmes, sir. I've heard about you and your friend, Dr. Watson. Walter, old man, I'm dreadfully sorry about your father. Are you now? Isn't that nice of you? Well, you'll be sorry enough when you hear that I'm going to take you to court and prove that I'm the real Earl of Loch Ness. Why, Walter, you're out of your mind. Am I? No. Father was out of his because he kept quiet all these years. But I'm going to have my rights. I've looked up the records. I've had genealogists working for months. And I've got all the facts that prove you're an imposter. Oh, man, what are you talking about? You know well enough. When Sherlock Holmes here sent your great uncle to the gallows 20 years ago, the title and estate should have come to my father. When I leave here tomorrow, I'm going straight to the finest lawyer in London. Heavens, man, if you believe this, why have you said nothing about it till now? Because I'm smart. I found out a thing or two since I've been staying here. And one of the things I found out is that your precious fiancée and her brother wouldn't look twice at you if it weren't for your money and the title. Shut up. You'll find out. She's a smart little filly, and she knows what kind of a track she's running Are on. you dirty... My compliments, sir. A very professional uppercut. Yes, and a very well-deserved one. I... Offensive scoundrel. Sorry about this. Uh, please don't say anything in front of Betty. Don't upset her. I quite understand. Come along, Watson. Let's go and find our rooms. <laughs> Nearly dinner time. Why are we wandering about here in the dark instead of having a glass of sherry with the others in the library? I'm a conscientious practitioner, Watson. I like to earn my fees. It uh, occurred to me that a further examination of this dining hall might prove profitable. Well, personally, Holmes, I think you're wasting your time on this case. <laughs> what makes you think that, old chap? It's perfectly obvious that young American fellow was impersonating the ghost a few nights ago. He knew his father was going to die and he wanted to build up the legend so as to make his own claim seem more believable. Well, that's very sound reasoning, Watson. Though to be logical in his perception, he should repeat the performance now that his father is dead. Well, ghosts only walk at midnight. So why don't we go and have a glass of sherry? Shh. Hmm? What is it, Holmes? Someone's coming in from the library. The lighted candle. Yes? Who is it? It's me, Mrs. McClintock. Oh, good gracious me. You, you gave me quite a start. I heard voices and I knew the candles were not alight in here, so I came in to see who it was. You're watching for the ghost, I suppose. Well, you'll no be disappointed, gentlemen, though you may see more than you bargain for. Those that meddle with ghostly things they don't comprehend are playing with something much more dangerous than fire. Fire burns. But the shades on dead people... Holmes, Holmes! Look up there in the gallery. The door's opening. It's the ghost. Aye, here he comes, the poor body. See the armor on him? And the way he's dragging one leg behind him. Yes, it's really quite an effective impersonation. And the twilight provides most appropriate lighting for his play acting, too. You mean it's the young American? Of course. Ah! Look, look behind him. There's another figure. Yes. Dressed in the same kind of armor and carrying a sword. The game's afoot, Watson. 
The ghost has seen him. He's turning. The second figure's raising his sword. Look out! Great heavens! He's knocked him through the railings. That must be a 20-foot fall. Come on, old fellow. Help me open his visor. Just a minute. Uh... Yes. It's Walter McMorris, the American. Though from the angle of his head, I would suggest that it might be the late Walter McMorris. Eh, Watson? He's dead all right, Holmes. Neck broken. Meanwhile, the second ticket has been able to slip back through that door and escape us. Come on, he was dressed in armor. He can't go very fast. Perhaps we can overtake him. Dr. Watson's story will continue in just a few seconds, which is all the time I need to tell you about Petri California Muscatel. Ever try Petri Muscatel? It's a wine that looks like sheer gold. And it's made from big, plump, juicy Muscat grapes. Boy, pop one of those Muscat grapes into your mouth and you know you've got something delicious. You know that. And you get the same flavor in Petri Muscatel. It's a perfect wine to serve a lady. Women love it. And that best time to serve it is after dinner or on a Sunday afternoon. You know, times like that. But just make sure it's Petri Muscatel, because that's the way to make sure it's going to be good. Remember, Petri. And now back to tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure and the story of The Limping Ghost of Loch Nair. Confound it, Holmes. There's no trace of the ghost in the musician's gallery. You gave him too much of a start, I'm afraid. <laughs> of course you didn't find him. You'll never find him because he's not mortal. Mrs. McClintock, is the original suit of armor, the one worn by the first Earl of Loch Ness, still in the castle? Aye, sir. It's in the library through that door there. I'll take you to it. Don't bother, thank you. We'll find it. Come on, Watson. Bring that candle with you. All right, Joe, huh? If you know what's good for you, you'll stop dabbling in matters your dinner really can. Holmes, what do you make of the second girl? Another imposter, obviously. But who could it have been? That's what we have to find out, old chap. Undoubtedly, someone knew that the American Walter McMorris was impersonating the ghost and used this macabre method to kill him. But why kill him? Possibly his claims to the title and estate were valid. Or perhaps some fanatic was so devoted to the Loch Nair legend that he assumed the role of ghost and killed him for his sacrilege. Hold the candle a little higher, will you, old chap? Here you are. Hello. Here's a suit of armor, Holmes. Lying in a heap on the floor. Oh, on the floor, eh? Whereas it obviously belongs on that stand over there. It's perfectly clear what's happened. The second figure used this armor and slipped it back in here while we were examining the dead man. Possibly, Watson, possibly. At least this armor gives us a definite clue. But it limits the field of possible suspects. How do you mean, Holmes? Well, it's an interesting fact that the human race has grown definitely larger in the past 400 years. Very few modern men can wear authentic ancient armor like this. For example, take the first item on the top of the heap lying on the floor here. These gauntlets of chain mail. Let's try them on. Well, much too small for exactly. me. Neither you nor I could have worn this suit. No, 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 nor could young Nolan, the estate agent. Whereas his sister could have done. Yes, so could Thomas the butler. He's a small fellow. And if it comes to that, Watson, our distinguished client, the young Earl of Loch Nair, is himself a small man. Right, Joe, so he is. And he might easily have had a motive. Young McMorris had disputed his right to the title earlier in the day. But we mustn't jump to conclusions. Nevertheless, you see what valuable evidence this armor has become. <laughs> Hello, hello. It sounds as if the rest of the party are on the scene. Yes, I suggest that we join them without making any reference to this suit of armor. Remember, old chap, one of them in there is a murderer. And we may have to set a trap to catch him. Are you sure he's dead, Dr. Watson? There's no doubt about it. His neck was broken instantly by the fall. It's dreadful. Father and son both dying on the same day. And you say the real ghost came up behind him, Mr. Holmes, and struck him so they crashed through the railing up there. I said another figure dressed in armor and killed him, Mr. Nolan. It was a real ghost. I saw him with my own two eyes. He killed that man for trying to bring shame on the name of Loch Nair. Shouldn't we get in touch with the police? How can I get a message to them tonight? Have you looked outside? We're almost completely snowed in. Snowed in? Oh, Alec, I'm frightened. Now, hush, darling. There's nothing to be afraid of anymore. No, at least we have the assurance that the ghost will not limp again. Why? Well, the murderer has no further motive for impersonating the ghost. To walk now would be to support the dead American's claims. No. 
We shall spend a quiet night, and tomorrow I shall communicate with the proper authorities as to my quite definite notions regarding the murderer's identity. Uh, but if the ghost should walk again, Mr. Hurd? Well, then, sir, I shall know that at last I've encountered a truly supernatural crime and shall retire from the practice of, um, of detection. <laughs> It's nearly two o'clock. You still over there by the window, puffing away that pipe of yours? Oh, you know, I can't help feeling that young McMorris knows a great deal more than he told us. A great deal more. There's a shifty look about him I don't like. Never did trust a fellow who could look you squarely in the eye. Don't you feel the same way, Holmes? Holmes. Holmes, where are you? Holmes! Shh, Black Watson. Where have you been? I thought you were over there by the window. I've uh, been talking to myself. Never mind that, old chap. Get your slippers on and your dressing gown. We're on the last lap of this strange, eventful tragedy. Oh, thank the Lord for that. Perhaps I can get some sleep. Holmes, where have you been? I went to the musician's gallery and baited the trap. Now it's ready to spring. Don't dawdle, Watson. Come I'm on, come on. I'm not dawdling. I'm not dawdling. What do you mean, you, you baited a trap? You'll see for yourself in a few moments. As a matter of fact, I really baited it when I said downstairs that if the real ghost should walk again, I would retire from the practice of detection. I didn't understand your saying that myself. Well, I was tempting the murderer to show his hand once more. Come on, come on, please. Where are we going? To wait behind the curtain at the foot of the stairs leading to the musician's gallery. And I hope we don't have to wait very long. Holmes. I'm getting a crick in my neck trying to peer through this wretched curtain. How much longer do we have to wait? Until our murderer arrives. Are you, are you certain you'll come? Not certain, but hopeful. Extremely hopeful. You know who it is, don't you? Yes. But my proof is too thin for a court of law. I must catch him in the act. Here he comes. Splendid. Let's go up and grab him. No, 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 no. They walk into my trap. He's coming towards the head of the stairs. Oh! Great start! Exactly. A simple piece of wire stretched across the gallery is remarkably effective, even with ghosts. Come on, Watson. Help me off with this visor. There we are. Oh. Good Lord, it's... Oh. It's James Nolan. Exactly. Well, what happened? You walked into a simple trap, my friend. I'm afraid the next trap will be more lethal, for it will undoubtedly prove to be the one beneath the gallows. <laughs> Now that we're headed back for London, Holmes, perhaps you'll settle one or two points in the case that are bothering me quite a bit. Oh, oh, with pleasure, my dear chap. What are they? I still don't see what Nolan's motive was in murdering the American. Oh, that should be obvious. He wanted to ensure that his sister's fiancé would enjoy undisputed title to the name and estates. Well, how did you know it was Nolan? When I examined the authentic suit of armor. You see, it was um, obvious it had never been worn. But I still don't quite oh, understand... Oh, come now, old chap. The suit of armor was in a heap on the floor. Yes? Yeah? And if it had been hastily discarded and get, um, well, the gauntlets were on top of the pile, you remember? Well, that's right, they were. If the suit had really been worn, the gauntlets would have been the first things to have been taken off, and so would have been um, underneath the pile. Hmm? Obviously, therefore, the armor had been disarranged in order to make people believe the real ghost had walked. Yes, yes. After the American's death, the suspects were four. Miss Nolan, her brother, Thomas, the butler, and... The Earl himself. Well, I ruled out Mrs. McClintock because you remember she was standing behind us at the time of the murder. Well, I'm beginning to understand. All the suspects except Nolan were small enough to have worn the armor. That's right. Therefore, only he could have pretended to use it. Pretended? But he, he did use it. Oh, no, my dear fellow. Undoubtedly, he procured a similar one of modern manufacture. An amazing case, Holmes. An interesting one at any rate. And once again, old fellow, I'm possibly reminded of an old Scottish litany. Scottish litany? Which one's that? Oh, you remember it. From ghoulies and ghosties and long-legged beasties and things that go bump in the night. <laughs> Good Lord, deliver us. Well, Doctor, that was really a swell story. You know, for a while there, I was beginning to believe in ghosts. Well, I'm ashamed to admit it, but at the time, so was I. <laughs> you know, this sounds silly, but... I bet it would be fun to be one of those legendary English ghosts. 
You know, go around sticking your nose into everybody's business and playing practical jokes like mad and nobody able to figure out who did it. That would really be fun in a way. Well, you can go around scaring people all you want to, but not for me. I think a ghost leads a terrible life myself. For instance, a ghost can't have the pleasure of eating a nice, juicy steak. Yeah, or drinking a glass of really good wine. Ah, uh, now you're talking, young fellow, my lad. Petri wine. Yeah, still talking, young You see, when I say good wine, I always mean Petri wine because you can depend on Petri. I know, I know. Why, the Petri family has been making wine for generations. Handing on down from father to son, from father to son, all their skill and knowledge and experience. When you realize they started the Petri business way back in the 1800s, well, common sense tells you the Petri family knows practically all there is to know about the fine art of turning luscious grapes into clear, fragrant wine. Yep, whether you're looking for a swell wine to serve before dinner or with dinner or after dinner, for any occasion, you just can't go wrong with a Petri wine because Petri took time to bring you good wine. And now, Doctor, what story are you going to tell us next week? Well, now, next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you a strange adventure that Holmes and I had in the English countryside. It concerns the apparent madness of a certain Colonel Warburton and the puzzling mystery of two dead dogs. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Crooked Man. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Oh, the Petri family took the time to bring you such good wine. So when you eat and when you cook, remember Petri wine. To make good food taste better, remember... Pet, Pet, Petri. This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. <laughs>